Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you. For those of you who I've not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Kate Levesque, and I'm the president here at Ursuline Academy in Dedham. We are delighted to have you with us this evening. This is the second in our 75th anniversary speaker series, and tonight's topic is particularly one that is near and dear to our hearts. It is a beautiful evening here in Dedham, but we have folks with us from all over. We have alumni who have registered from Wisconsin and Ohio. We have parents, and we also have current parents as well as the parents of new students who will join our community in September. So a particularly warm welcome to the new folks. We have other friends who've joined us from Maine and Missouri, Indiana and Texas. Thanks to each of you for making time to join us this evening. Tonight's program is a special one because it is uniquely Ursuline. We're gonna go on a little bit of time travel from the early 1500s in Brescia, Italy, all the way to present day Ursuline in Dedham, Massachusetts. 500 years is a lot to cover in just an hour or so, but I think you'll have a flavor for the evolution of the Ursuline order from St. Angela Marici, our foundress, to the school that we know and love today. There's something remarkable I have to say that I find about St. Angela Marici and it is her ability to stay relevant. Um, there are words that we of hers that we often use and quote because they are as valid and as valuable and timeless today as they were when she shared them with her company of Ursuline sisters. So just a few housekeeping issues before we get started. Um, we ask that during the speaking portion of the presentation that you stay muted uh, we know folks are relaxing at home this evening and there might be an errant dog walking through the kitchen. We are also recording this evening's presentation and it will be used, I know, in some of our theology classes in days to come. Um, and after our third speaker this evening, um, we encourage you to ask questions. Um, one of the beauties of Zoom is that we can have a warm and interactive conversation among friends. So feel free to either put your questions into the chat feature at the lower portion of your screen um, and we'll read them for you from there. Or uh, when we ask for questions, if you'd like to unmute and simply speak up, we'd love to hear from you. So that is enough of the housekeeping and the details. So let's get on with our show this evening. I'm going to introduce our three panelists at the beginning of the program and then allow them to seamlessly pass the baton from one to another. So our first guest tonight, and we are just thrilled to have her with us, is Sister Elisa Ryan. Sister Elisa is a graduate of one of our sister schools, Ursuline Academy in St. Louis. As an Ursuline sister, she has been a teacher and a principal in Ursuline schools. She has served in leadership, both in the central province of the Ursulines to which Ursuline Dedham belongs, and also on the international leadership team. And she was most recently a vocation minister, helping young adults discover their own gifts and call to serve. Currently, Sister Elisa Ryan is the provincial of the central province and leads uh, heads their leadership team. Our second guest this evening is Nancy Lusignan Schultz. Nancy is a professor emirata of English at Salem State University and the author of Fire and Roses, The Burning of the Ursuline Convent 1834, and several other books as well, including one which she served as a co-editor on, which I'd like to read, called The Veil of Fear, 19th Century Convent Tales. So Nancy, we're delighted to have you with us to add this important piece of our history for tonight's topic. And finally, our third guest is Sister Angela Krippendorf. Sister Angela is an Ursuline alumna graduating from our Boston location, in the late 50s, who then went on to complete her education at Boston State College, the University of Maine, and ultimately Boston College. She has been a teacher at all grade levels and a principal for 16 years at St. John's Catholic School in uh, Brunswick, Maine. She has served as provincial of the Northeast Province in both Maine and Massachusetts, and currently resides in Lewiston, Maine. So with that, a warm welcome to our guests and a hearty thank you to our three panelists. 
We're delighted to have each and every one of you with us tonight. And Sister Elisa, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be with you in this anniversary year. The symbol of a tree is often used as an image of the Earthline family around the world. It's a tree full of possibility from the beginning of its life up to now. All of you who are part of the Earthline Academy of Dedham community are branches of that tree sharing in its life. As students, parents, teachers, alums, and friends of the school, you share in the 75 year legacy of the school and the almost 500 year history of the Ursulines. That means you also share in the spirit and charism of our amazing foundress. St. Angela Marici. Angela was born around 1474 in Desenzano in Northern Italy into a world marked by moral suffering and struggle, a world much like our own. She was a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, Christopher Columbus, Ignatius of Loyola, Martin Luther, Henry VIII, Copernicus, Catherine of Aragon, and Teresa of Avila. Orphaned at a young age, Angela moved to stay with relatives and then to the larger Italian city, Brescia. Captivated by God, whom she sought and found everywhere, she became a deeply contemplative woman. She is frequently characterized by the Italian word piacevolezza, which means a gracious kindness and respect for every person. She was a peacemaker and reconciler, able to relate to all types of people who did come to her for assistance. Angela was inspired by the courage of the martyr Saint Ursula and influenced by the humble spirituality of Francis of Assisi, whose love for God and all creatures, especially the poor, touched her heart. A woman of great courage herself, she traveled from Northern Italy to Rome and at age 50, made a pilgrimage from Italy to the Holy Land Neither of those trips a small feat in those days. Throughout her life, Angela was unafraid to live by faith, take risks, or be creative. In 1535, a time when women had basically only two options, marriage or religious life in the cloister that was a walled monastery, Angela, at the age of 60, felt called to find a new way for women. She began the company of St. Ursula with 28 women companions. Living united in heart, the women of this company would be consecrated to God, live the gospel among the people, and help all women recognize their importance and dignity. And just to put this in a worldwide historical perspective, this was happening just four years after Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego in Mexico. Angela died in 1540 on January 27th, the day we celebrate her feast. The company she founded lived on, attracted more members and began to spread. Because of historical events in the church, Ursulines began to live together in convents and became the Order of St. Ursula. We sisters have OSU after our names, Order of St. Ursula. Ursulines were asked to begin educating young women in various countries in Europe. 
often where women had not previously had opportunity for education. Within 100 years, Angela's small company was spreading around the world. By the end of the 19th century, monasteries of Ursulines were found on every continent, about 300 of them. They were autonomous, each connected to the bishop of the local diocese. In 1900, Pope Leo XIII in Rome made known to the Ursulines of the world his desire to see them form a union to strengthen, to strengthen their international bonds and connections. All were invited. In response, delegates from 71 houses came to a meeting in Rome. After 300 years of autonomous houses and monasteries, the Roman Union gave a united international expression to Angela's charism. We are Roman Union Ursulines. I'd like to share just a few other important moments from our history. In 1639, Mother Marie of the Incarnation sailed with several other Ursulines from their native France or Canada among the first women religious to do so. Marie learned both the Algonquin and Iroquoian languages to teach the people. The school she founded still operating in Quebec is the oldest institution of learning for young women in North America. Marie was canonized just a few years ago by Pope Francis. In 1727, Mother Marie Tranchepin and 11 other Ursulines traveled from France to come to New Orleans. They began a convent there and can claim many firsts for what is now the United States. First convent, first Catholic school still operating, first classes for female African slaves, free women of color and Native Americans and first female pharmacist and Ursuline sister. At the end of the 18th century, during the French Revolution, Ursulines in France tried to continue their apostolate as long as they could, but suppressions and dispersions greatly hindered them. Many were jailed, some in their own convents. 27 were guillotined, and are now honored as martyrs of the faith. In the 20th century, when the Nazis arrived at the Ursuline convent in Poland to arrest those who were sheltering Jewish girls, the only one they found was this one, the superior, Mother Clemenza. She had sent all the others away to safety. She was murdered at Auschwitz in 1943 and later beatified by Pope John Paul II. Sister Dorothy Kazel, a Cleveland Ursuline, re Ursuline, returned to her missionary work in El Salvador in 1980, knowing that church workers were being targeted. She and three others were assaulted and murdered by military shortly after. This was at the same period of history when Oscar Romero, and several Jesuits were also martyred. Today, we Roman Union Ursulines number about 1,500 worldwide and serve in 36 countries, the newest one being Vietnam. Our Roman Union is divided into geographical provinces. We belong to the central province of the United States. We have about 75 sisters living and serving in Missouri, Illinois, Louisiana, Texas, Maine, and Massachusetts. There are two other provinces of the Roman Union Ursulines in the United States, with sisters serving in New York, Delaware, California, Montana, Idaho, and Alaska. There are 43 different branches of Ursuline groups. The Roman Union is one 
of the 43 branches. There are other unions. The Canadian Union has sisters in Canada and Japan. A Belgian union, you see a picture of the sisters in the bottom left, has almost 800 Ursline sisters in India. They are right now ministering to people with COVID in India. There are other smaller independent groups in Cincinnati, Louisville, as well as in Germany, Italy, and other places, all stemming from Angela. Representatives of all our Roman Union provinces gather once every six years for a general chapter in Rome. The last general chapter took place a year and a half ago with the theme of a global community moving into new life, this assembly spent time discussing our Ursuline life, charism and mission for the 21st century and set directions for the next six years. As I said at the beginning, you, all of you share the charism of Angela as much as we sisters do. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit for all of us today. It is a charism of respect for individuals, of gentle compassion, courageous risk-taking, listening to the signs of the times and doing what we can to affirm and bring life to others. In this 75th anniversary year, we might ask ourselves, in what special ways do we show the spirit of Angela Marici to others. As you celebrate this year, know that we sisters are deeply grateful for your collaboration. And we are united in heart and prayer with you. St. Angela said, believe, hope, act, and you will see wonderful things. And now this concludes my part of the panel. And I'm happy to pass the program to Nancy Schultz. Hello, can you hear me okay? All right, well, thank you all for coming to join us this evening. And I really wanna thank the organizers for inviting me. And it is a special pleasure for me to participate in a panel with sister Elisa Ryan and Angela Krippendorf. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Okay. We are gonna be looking at the question of what would lead a mob of Protestant arsonists to attack a Roman Catholic convent and elite girls boarding school in civilized 19th century Boston. During this talk, I will touch upon some of the causes of the event. One of the most notorious acts of anti-Catholic violence in the history of the United States. To follow this, the history of Sister Elisa's talk, I'll now trace the history of the Boston founders. Father John Thayer, a Protestant convert, dreamed of establishing an Ursuline convent in Boston. Traveling to Europe in 1803, he settled for a time in Limerick, Ireland. He boarded with a family named Ryan and spoke to them of his plan. Two of his host daughters, Mary and Catherine, offered to join the community along with two other members of the family. They planned to study and take their vows at Trois Rivières in Canada and then to begin uh, the foundation of a convent in Boston. Unfortunately, Father Thayer did not live long enough to see his dream become a reality, but he bequeathed his life savings to the Ursulines. These were to be managed by Father Francis Matignon, an assistant of Bishop Cheveris in Boston, Matinone was a very shrewd investor and doubled Thayer's original legacy through wise investment. And he himself left the Ursulines an additional $2,500 upon his death. 
an estate worth a total of nearly half a million dollars in today's money. Um, the Ryans, who took the religious names Sister Mary Joseph and Mary Magdalene, along with their two relatives, Augustine and Angela, moved into their new home adjacent to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross on Franklin Street, Boston. Four American religious women also joined them. There they opened a school for impoverished girls, mainly the daughters of Irish immigrants. The school accepted about 100 students, half of whom attended school during the morning hours and the other half in the afternoon. Thanks to the order's strong financial position, the students paid no tuition. Following Bishop Chevres's departure in 1823, many of the sisters who founded the school fell ill with tuberculosis. With so many having succumbed, new leadership in 1824 was found in Sister St. George, known before her vows as Marianne Moffat. She allied herself with Bishop Benedict Joseph Fenwick, Bishop Chevres's successor, who believed that the school's unwholesome urban location was destroying the health of the staff. He desired to move the convent and school to a more spacious and healthy quarters. In 1826, with proceeds from the sale of the Boston site, 10 acres were purchased, purchased on top of a hill in Charlestown upon which the new convent and academy would be built. Bishop Fenwick immediately set to work overseeing improvements. A farmhouse which stood on the ground was expanded to include a kitchen and a chapel. He constructed a fence for the cloistered Ursulines, dug a well, built a new road, landscaped the grounds with terraces and gardens, and ultimately expanded the property to a total of 24 acres through subsequent purchases over the next several years. This new school named Mount Benedict in honor of Fenwick would differ starkly from its predecessor. With its secluded lifestyle and extensive curriculum, the academy attracted the daughters of upper-class families, often Unitarians, who were willing to send their daughters great distances, to be separated from them for long periods, to put aside their religious prejudices, knowing that the girls would return home fully prepared to take their place in the society in which they were to move. No longer tuition free, the cost of attendance was now $160 a year, which is the equivalent about, of about $4,500 today. In 1928, Bishop Fenwick began to advertise for students, and by the early 1830s, the school was thriving with 50 to 60 boarders per year. The young ladies typically rose before 6 a.m., attended morning prayer, followed by 30 minutes of silence. Then the students had a light breakfast of bread, butter, and milk, before three and a half hours of class. They would break around 11 o'clock for lunch, recess or other activities before returning to the classroom for an afternoon session until 5 p.m. The day concluded with afternoon tea followed by free time and evening prayer. Unfortunately, this pinnacle of Catholic girls education was to be short-lived. On August 11th, 1834, a mob appeared outside of the convent, scattering its inhabitants and burning the structures on the property.
Nashville. A mob of 100 Protestant men, mostly laborers from the nearby brickyards, crashed through the gates of the Ursuline convent atop Mount Benedict. The mother superior came to the window. She threatened the crowd that she had at her command an army of 20,000 Irishmen who would burn the roofs of their houses over their heads if they did not leave her property immediately. And the crowd just got angrier and angrier until they finally stormed through the gates and broke into the front door of the convent. There was looting, sacrilege, book burning. 17-year-old Marvin Marcy conducted a mock auction with the bishop's classical library. As he consigned books to the flames, he would shout, going once, going twice, sold, and he would throw the books into the fire. Um, while Fire and Roses explores a complex web of tensions that led to the Academy's destruction, including ethnic, social, economic, and of course, religious, the rioters' response to Moffat stands out as a major cause of the attack. Ignoring many of the cultural expectations for women of the time, Moffat was outspoken and abrupt with those she considered her intellectual and social inferiors. She interacted comfortably with the prominent physicians, lawyers, and military officers, mostly wealthy Protestants, who sent their daughters to her elite European style school. Moffat's Canadian origins, strong personality and competent leadership of a self-sufficient female community that included a large farm and a profitable school made the Ursulines a target of Charlestown's working class men who deeply resented their success. Despite her considerable administrative talent, Moffat ultimately alienated Bishop Fenwick and other Catholic authorities as well. Before the torching of the Ursuline convent, Moffat and Fenwick had worked very effectively together, but their collegial relationship could not withstand the strain of that event. Almost immediately, they were of divided opinions as to the future direction of the Mount Benedict Academy for Girls. Moffat made several decisions about the school without consulting Fenwick, including renting a mansion in Roxbury and reopening the school. This new school was also threatened with destruction by a mob and Moffat found herself supervising an armed guard keeping watch over the building. <clears throat> Despite her insistence on remaining in Boston to rebuild her school, Moffat had been sent back to Quebec by Catholic authorities within a year of the 1834 attack. In May, 1836, she walked out of the monastery door having applied for and been given permission to join the Ursuline, Ursulines in New Orleans. She never arrived and that convent has no record of her. She simply seems to have vanished. The fate of Marianne Moffat and the whereabouts of a portrait of her that was once part of the Quebec Monastery's collection remains unknown. One of the last mentions we have of Marianne Moffat is in a letter Bishop Fenwick wrote to the Bishop of Quebec in 1838. Apparently in response to that Bishop's inquiry, Fenwick wrote, of Madame St. George, I learned nothing since her departure from Quebec. Various rumors represent her as being in St. Louis and as having thrown off all restraint while other accounts have stated that she is dead. I know not which to credit or whether I ought to credit any. The Ursuline community gave their institution one last chance beginning in August, 1838, led by Mary Barber, who had been a nun in Charlestown, whose religious name was Sister Mary Benedict. 
The school did not thrive under her leadership. And by 1841, Mary Benedict was living outside of Cloister and under threat of excommunication by Bishop Fenwick. In 1844, Mary Benedict, who was the last remaining trustee, signed over the entirety of the Ursuline property to Bishop Fenwick and the Archdiocese of Boston for a mere $1,000 in exchange for his paying off her debts. She died in Quebec a year later. By the end of 1870, the property had been sold and the proceeds funded Boston's new Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Some of the bricks from the old convent were used to form the arch in the entranceway to the cathedral. Thank you very much. And now Sister Angela will conclude this presentation with her, um, her lovely history as well. Uh, thank you. Anyway, Nancy, this is a historical journey in the fast lane. Some of you probably traveled in the past in some of parts of this journey. Happy memories. You'll see some lovely photos along the way. In 1946, Archbishop Richard Cushing invited Ursulines to open a school on 12 Arlington Street, Commonwealth Avenue. It really was um, an effort at reconciliation for what had happened in the past. The, the former Sears estate, then occupied by the personnel of Army and Navy Officers Club, was 40, it had 48 rooms and it was a brownstone building right near the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. It was a darling environment, delightful in the heart of the city. In April of 1946, Mother Therese Walsh, Sister Reparata Walsh of New Rochelle, assisted Mr. Edward P. Coy, better known in the Ursline world as Uncle Eddie, the brother of Sister Agnes Hoy of the College of New Rochelle, who came to approve the choice. Four months later, adaptations were made for a school and a convent. This is the beautiful chapel. Archbishop Cushing celebrated the first mass in the temporary chapel, which I believe was the library at that time, and the following both followed with benediction. In September of 1946, Ursline Academy opened on 12 Allington Street with 45 students, both elementary and secondary school level. In 1953, the Ursulines began transferring sisters from the Northeast province, known as the Franco-American province, and some Ursuline sisters from the Eastern province. In 1956, June, Mother Philip Boyle obtained permission to seek a larger location in order to meet the needs of the growing Ursuline apostolate. In short order, the dream became a reality. There's the convent. It, a spacious dwelling of 26 rooms built of brick and limestone of the Georgian style in Dedham, Mass, known as the Skinner Estate, had been sold to Mrs. Moulton and was up for sale again. All agreed this was an ideal location. The purchase was made. But that staircase is where our girls stand for graduation photos. On 1957, October, for financial and safety reasons, the provincial eight resided in Dedham in the carriage house. A kindergarten opened in the estate living room and in the solarium. On 1958, here are your little kindergartners in the main lobby of that beautiful um, estate that you saw before. They used to have their kindergarten show there, all marble floor. 
For financial and safety reasons, the provincial eight resided in Dedham, in the carriage house, a kindergarten opened in the estate living room in the solarium. And in 1958, while the new school building was under construction, 30 kindergartners and 59th graders were in Dedham. The classrooms were bedrooms in the estate. Grades 10, 11, and 12 remained on Arlington Street for the last year. I remember going to Dedham as a senior and sharing with the ninth graders how Ursline young ladies behave. The town of Dedham feared that new building in, on Louder Street would detract from the lovely winding Indian path known as Louder Street. The Ursulines had to prove that the contractor took that into consideration. The new school was set back and the high stone wall was remodeled into graduating steps levels along the roadway. It still reflects the Indian pathway. In January, 1958, Archbishop Cushing was elevated to the rank of Cardinal by Pope John XXIII. He purchased the Arlington Street building, which helped with our Dedham construction costs, that prop property then became the property of the Boston Diocese. Now it is a condo. This was the staircase of 12 Arlington Street. And if that picture was taken, as you can see, 1959, that was the last graduation class of 14 students, a very distinguished group. At least we thought we were. In September 59, Louder Street welcomed 250 students in grades seven to 12 and kindergarten. I am delighted to be able to share this short but vital history of the Ursline Foundation of 12 Arlington Street and 65 Louder Street, Dedham. I was privileged to have known Sister Mark Sullivan, Sister Dorothy Walsh, Sister Agnes Hoy, and Sister Ann Boyle. These were founding mothers who had great courage to forge forward in those times. This was a great financial undertaking for the sisters. So much so that when Sister Ursula with her kindergarten had her children build a snowman on the patio and use charcoal from the furnace, she received a phone call from Sister Ann Boyle who was provincial, return the charcoal, we need it for heat. It is really remarkable that in less than 15 years, Ursline Academy had grown from 45 students in 1946 to 250 school students in September, 1959. They prepared the way. We have been blessed to have that extraordinary dedication throughout the years from 46 to 2021. I urge you to come and visit the expansion of the campus on the historic Indian path. Without doubt, Ursline Academy enhances the path. A special thank you to you, Kate, a former graduate at the helm and the dedicated faculty, staff and families, which also include graduates who have supported the mission. Thank you. We are still on the journey and confident that our students are making a difference and will continue to make a, a difference in the world of today, all in the spirit of Servian. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Angela, Sister Elisa Ryan and Nancy for that wonderful history. That was just, just great. And uh, you took us through 500 years, but you did it beautifully and gracefully. So thank you all. Um, at this point, I would encourage all of you who are here with us this evening to ask questions. Um, as I said earlier, feel free to either put them in the chat or to simply unmute yourself and speak up. And uh, 
we'd, we'd love to, to hear from you and begin a conversation that will help each one of us understand Ursuline better. Um, I did also want to add that we are blessed tonight to have faculty and students with us as well. And so uh, many generations here. Um, I had the privilege today of sitting in on a theology class and listening to the Bright Minds and Sister Angela, I can tell you they are indeed carrying on the work of St. Angela. So uh, at this point, uh, feel free to ask questions. Hi, Kate. Yes, Meredith. Hi, this is Meredith. I am a um, proud alumna of 89 and a current parent of a sophomore at Ursuline. And I, I realized when this came up that I, I didn't know enough about Ursuline history um, and really wanted to learn a little bit more. And what I'm really curious about is the other schools, um, the other Ursuline schools throughout the country and the world really, I'm wondering, are there a lot of similarities? Um, I, you know, I think Ursuline and I think the green and white shield, right? The Servium shield, I think green plaid. And I'm wondering, are those sorts of traditions similar at the other schools or are they different? And where did they even sort of come from? Wonderful question, Meredith, thank you. Sister Elisa, would you like to answer that one? Sure. So um, currently in the central province, we Ursline sisters sponsor five schools. Uh, there's Ursline Academy in Dallas, Ursline Academy in New Orleans, Ursline Academy here in St. Louis, where I am, um, Ursline Academy in uh, Dedham, and uh, Mount Marisi Academy, which is an elementary school in Waterville, Maine. And I can tell you that for the, high, I mean, I, we can sort of compare the high schools, you know, and uh, the girls always want to know, do do all the schools have the same plaid? Well, certainly not, <laughs> certainly not. But um, the Serviam, Serviam is an international uh, um, motto for all of our schools around the world. So you can go to a place like uh, Indonesia, to Africa, to Europe, or science schools, and you will see the Serviam shield on little Asian children or African children or European uh, high, school, high schoolers, whatever. Serviam, and it's it's much more than just the shield, of course, it's the spirit of service. Um, the spirit of St. Angela is really um, very real in our schools around the world. Um, other traditions, graduation traditions and things like that, passing on of roses or candles or, you know, induction into alumni, it depends, it varies a bit from school to school. Great. Thank you. Thanks, sister. We've had a couple things come into our chat. Someone has asked the name of the Native American tribe who created the Indian path that we now know as Louder Street. Um, wonderful question. It would be a, a great trivia thing. Uh, does anyone know the answer to it? Anyone who's with us this evening? And if not, um, I have the name of the person who has asked it. So we will find that out and get back to you. Um, so thank you. And she also extends her thanks to our three speakers this evening. Um, we have another alumna who's asked us to distribute a book list or reference guide on the school's website uh, so that she can learn more about the history. Um, and we certainly can do that. There is a, a button, so to speak, uh, for all 75th anniversary uh, related items on our website. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, our team at the school if we can go to work. Uh, putting together some of the materials that served as the background for this evening. That would, that's a great idea. Hi, Kate. This is Patty um, Cummins, class of 77, your class. Yes, lovely um, to see you. Nice to see you too. I was thinking as I was watching this and learning more and more, how great would it be to have a static display at the school uh, with pictures of some of these founding mothers and uh, maybe, I mean, having the history of our, our community, but also, um, you know, those that, I mean, I had, I, Mother, uh, Mother Anne accepted me into the school. I had Sister Agnes Hoy teach me. Um, I had, we had Sister Dorothy Walsh, um, Sister Robert, all of these beautiful women, as far as Sister Angela and Sister Martha, uh, but anyway, I think uh, it would be really cool to have 
um, a hallway or a static display somewhere, or even a pop-up museum from time to time, highlighting a couple of uh, people or um, you know historical events from from the old days and the new days. You know, How what do you think? I think it's a great idea. Um, through the generosity of the senior parents of the class of, and please don't hold me this, to this, it's either the class of 17 or 18. Some funds have been raised for archival displays on campus. Um, and so they are waiting for us to do a facilities master plan and to know where we can put it so that we won't have to dismantle it and move it. Um, but there is that call for making sure that we preserve the history that we have, not only preserve it, but share it with the generations to come. Um, so thank you, Patty. Yeah, there's, there's thinking happening along those lines and we need to make sure that it gets done. That's great. And I was just thinking now, how cool would it be for students maybe to be docents of that and do a virtual tour um, and you could have uh, a club doing that. You know, that would be really cool. Yeah, no, it would be lovely. It would be lovely. You're right. And Patty and I, for those of you who don't know, are classmates. I think it's amazing that um, our students today, I think, are learning more about the Ursuline history than we learned when we were students because we had the Ursuline sisters in our midst. And I think they just lived and spread this, the charism of St. Angela. But now we, we have to work a little harder to make sure that we pass it on. So... Yeah, thank you. I also just got a message from someone behind the scenes here who said that there is work underway with the help of someone um, who is intimately familiar with the history of the convent. So the archival work is happening behind the scenes. Along those same lines, um, on the question of the Indian tribe, um, we have with us tonight, Katie McNally, who is an alum of Ursuline. She has been at Ursuline in a variety of roles but has gone on to pursue graduate studies and is now an archivist. And uh, Katie has shared with us that the Wampanoag tribe lived in the present day Dedham area. And so it is likely that Louder Street was formed by them. So Katie, thank you so much. This is like a, a phone a friend game. We have all the answers we need right among our group. This is great. Um, the next question comes to us. Um, when did the sisters change from being called mother to sister? I think it's a wonderful question. Sister Elisa, would you like that one? Yeah, I think Sister Angela can help me remember. I think it was uh, around the time of Vatican Council too. Does that sound was, right, Angela? Well, I don't know in each province, but for us in Boston, it was in 58, I believe. Yeah, that was- Because they came in after a holiday and they were in their shorter, dresses that the shorter veil and that type of thing it was there were funny little changes that came slowly yeah yeah i think it was right around the time of vatican council too so yeah. that is you know the uh, right around 60 68 to 62 something like that okay that was that's early for us good sometimes in speaking with older alums I need a little bit of a, a cheat sheet because they will speak of a sister as mother so-and-so, but I knew yeah. her when I was at Ursuline as sister so-and-so. So you need yeah. the, 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 the decoder ring, so to speak. We did have someone else. The purpose, the oh, purpose ahead, of the mother was the education process, the motherly education was one of the reasons why they used the title mother at okay. that time, but then it seemed inappropriate. All right, good to know. Um, someone else has chimed in in the chat to say that she I, um, has a cousin uh, who is an alum of Ursuline St. Louis in the class of 99. And in comparing notes, they have found differences in traditions between Dedham and St. Louis, but also the same general feeling. Um, so it's interesting. Other questions from our audience this evening, we'd be happy to answer. Hey, if I may. Yes. Um, well, Hi, Kathy. How, how are you? First, I, I want to say thank you so much to all of our presenters. This has just been, been fabulous history and uh, education. I'm new to the Ursuline community. Um, I've actually just joined the staff at uh, Louder Street as the Chief Enrollment Officer. 
Um, and in full transparency, I was educated by the Mercy Sisters. So <laughs> just wanna say that. But I am curious um, in, the, in the brief um, history that you shared, if there are any writings of Sister Angela um, that are available if they have survived and um, if they have, and um, you have any favorites among them that you have lived by in your own, own lives. Sister Elisa, would you want to kick that off for us? Yeah, we have many. Uh, the main writings of St. Angela are the, the rule that she left for the company of St. Ursula and um, what she what we call her her testament and it's like her last testament and it is they are beautiful beautiful writings um, written for the members of the company and those who would assist them and uh, her spirituality just shines in those writings so uh, you know if you want to if you want to uh, get my email or something I could see that you would get you could I could get you some of those writings it's a little book, it's not big, but that is basically what she left us by way of writing and they're beautiful. I have to say, I feel remiss in this because Kathy joined us, as she said, just about a week and a half ago. Um, most of our academic employees join us with the start of the new school year. And so there is a formation piece um, and uh, they are, um, begin their education in St. Angela at that time. So we'll do that with all new employees at the end of August. But Kathy, I have uh, the, the writings of St. Angela as well in my office. So I'll make sure we get a copy to you. So fabulous, thank you. Okay. Other questions from our audience this evening? It's Patty again. Sure, Patty, go ahead. I just wanted to um, let Nancy Schultz know how much I enjoyed her book. And uh, I wanna read that again about the burning of the Charlestown convent and that history there. And I see a lot of the names are also Boston College names because we have Fenwick and, and Chevrus and all of those buildings over at Boston College, which is another, that's where I went to college. Um, so I'm interested in finding out more about uh, them, them through this. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for the book. It was really very well done. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. And um, I did want to point out that the portrait of Benedict Fenwick that I showed the slide, that was actually found in the attic of the Denim Earth Lines by Sister Rita Barasa. Um, and we did some sleuthing together and um, that portrait is now restored and at the College of the Holy Cross um, because Benedict Fenwick went on to found Holy Cross after the destruction of the Charlestown convent. So it's right, sits right in the president's office at Holy Cross these days. Nancy, while you're on the screen, we have a question um, from someone. How did you become interested in the Ursuline convent and the social presence it represented? Um, well, there were a couple of ways that I became interested. I was actually working on um, doing some research on Harriet Beecher Stowe, and I've sort of developed um, a specialty in her work over the years. And while researching her, I found out that her father, Lyman P Beecher, gave two anti-Catholic or three anti-Catholic sermons in Boston on the day before the riot. And caused the riot or helped cause the riot. So I was very shocked by that. And then I, at the same time, I was living in Somerville, which is the current location of those, of where the ruins were. Um, that part of Charlestown became Somerville. And they, the Somerville Public Library had a great collection and I started reading up on it and I just became addicted. <laughs> To the story, I was just so taken with the story. I became it became an obsession. Well, we're glad you became obsessed because you brought it to life for us. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions, folks would like to share? Um, <clears throat> hi. Um, if if I could just give a comment, if that's of course. All right. Yes. Um, my daughter is a 2004 graduate of Dedham, and listening to this 
a big smile on my face. And I, I guess I just want to say thank you to everyone. The foundation that the school gave her is incredible. And maybe, maybe me, even as a parent, didn't realize it at the time. But seeing her, you know, go through um, college, working, she's a mother now. Just seeing her, you all had a part to play in that whether or not directly or indirectly. And I appreciate it. And I just wanted to say thank you. Well, Alana, thank you for saying that. And particularly to the faculty and staff who are on tonight, those words from parents are really the best, best thanks that they can get. So thank you for saying that and sharing with us. Okay, and one other thing that's very, uh, she'll probably, if she finds out that I said this, she actually got married in her graduation dress. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. She went looking and she said, I really just want this. And um, yeah, so. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, we have a hand raised um, by Barbara. Is it Barbara Rico? Would you like to chime in? Perhaps you're still muted, Barbara. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm. Zooming in from Los Angeles, used to live on uh, Sawyer Drive right up the street and uh, the class of 73. I did want to note that I believe it was in Professor Schultz's book, there was an image of a cross that had come from the Boston um, uh, school. And um, growing up, I remember seeing that cross when I went to mass in Dedham. So I wanna thank you for that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Barbara, for sharing that. It's wonderful how images can take us right back to where we were so many years ago. Thank you. And thanks for coming to us from California. This is great. You know, I know the pandemic has obviously been challenging on so many, but I think Zoom has to be one of the silver linings that we have all come to realize because of it. Um, that we are able to connect in ways that we might not have been able to do before the pandemic. So it's good to, good to be together, even virtually. To follow up on that, I thought that uh, maybe Sister Angela can answer this question. Um, I thought that there was at the Dedham Convent a chalice or um, ciborium or something that had come from the fire. Is that right? Yes, yes there is the ciborium is still there as far as I know it is. And also, supposedly we're going to have at Boston College a, a library of religious, all the religious of Boston, which is going to be wonderful for the artifacts of um, Ursline. So hopefully, I know it won't happen tomorrow, but I know it's in the making which is wonderful, Boston College said they would do it. And they want all the different religious groups, which I think is critical for this time in history. Very important. That's wonderful, sister. And what a wonderful nod yeah. to the, all the religious of the Boston Archdiocese. That's great. Yes. That's great. Yes, I think it's I can be, it will probably prove to be very significant in time. Sure. I'm hoping anyway. Sure. Um, thank you. I believe Jess Lyons has her hand up, Jess. And Jess is a theology teacher with us at Ursuline. Welcome. Oh, get her Here off. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Jess, you came up, you were unmuted for a minute and then you went back on. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, thank you yes. so much. That was so informative and helpful. Um, Nancy, we read the 10th graders read, I can't remember now if it was the prologue or the first chapter of your book this year. And, um, you know, we did a bit of a historical investigation and I'd love to get my hands on some um, primary source docs for them next year. So I don't know if maybe I can email, so, well, I can get student email to one of you guys. I don't know if there's like, they're accessible online or I'd just love to um, bring in some primary sources for them. Um, Happy to help, but they're, they're, everything is footnoted in the book, so you should be able to find exactly where everything is from, but I'm also happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. And Jess, we have, I think it was before you came to Ursuline, just maybe the year before you came, but we have had Nancy come to campus and speak as well. So Nancy, it might be time to invite you back to speak to a new crop of students. 
Um, I'd be delighted anytime. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. I think we're coming down the home stretch here this evening. It's lovely to have everyone with us. You know, it was remarkable to look at the pictures that were shown of Arlington Street. Um, I saw Sister Angela standing on the top mm -hmm. step of the class of 59. Um, Carol Butner Maloof is with us. And Carol, I think I saw you in those photos as well. So we're delighted you're with us this evening. Good to have you here. Um, and I think, as I said, we're, we're coming down to the, the end, I think. It has been just delightful to spend time with all of you this evening. And again, thank you for making the time to be with us. Um, you perhaps have heard me say this if you were on the first uh, episode of our speaker series, but one of the goals of our 75th reunion, our anniversary year, I should say, is to renew ties and strengthen ties among all members of our community. So as I look here, I see alumni of Ursline from the 50s, all the way to alumni of Ursuline from the 2020s and yet to graduate. And how wonderful to connect people across 70 plus years of Ursuline history. Um, it's also great to connect us geographically and then also to have with us Sister Angela's in Maine, Nancy here in Massachusetts, I believe, and Sister Elisa Ryan coming to us from St. Louis. There are other Ursuline sisters of the central province with us tonight as well from Texas and some of our other locations. So it is truly good for us to be together. Tonight, as I mentioned, marks our second event in our speaker series. Um, our next event uh, will happen in June, on June 16th, uh, again by Zoom. Um, and our speaker will be Mark Shriver. Um, and we've timed this uh, to coincide with Father's Day. And we'll be encouraging our students to grab dad and settle in on the couch and maybe spend some Father's Day time with dad. It's not on Father's Day, uh, but it's within a few days of it. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to say, uh, back to fostering ties, if you would like to get involved with our 75th anniversary celebrations, please use the email you see on the screen, 75 years at UrsulineAcademy.net. Um, we would love to hear from you. And there are many, many ways for people to get involved. Um, so let's keep the conversation going. Again, my thanks to each and every one of you for being here tonight. As we emerge from COVID conditions, um, our wishes to all of you are for good health um, and uh, that you and your loved ones stay safe in the days ahead. Um, thank you for living the mission of Ursuline, as I know each and every one of you do in your lives. And again, a special thanks to Sister Angela Crippendorf, Sister Elisa Ryan, and to Nancy Schultz, as well as to Ursuline's behind the scenes team, um, phenomenal faculty and staff that we have at Ursuline who make all of this possible this evening. So good night, God bless and be well. Thank you.